Um, hi, everyone. Uh, we'll just wait for a few more minutes to let people come in into the room. Um, yeah, so some of the details is that um, I think from the platform, you can actually uh, see that there are resources that you can actually use. So some of the things such as slides for today, uh, those are things that you could uh, also download ahead of time uh, for you to follow along in terms of like what is going to be available. Uh, there is also the Q&A portion. So, um, so part and parcel of the Q&A portion, I do have a couple of people on the call with me from GitLab as well. And they will also be answering the questions uh, during the presentation. So for example, if you have questions and I'm still doing the demo, uh, we can try to answer that for you uh, retrospectively. Just one second. All right. Um, so, yeah. Um, so just uh, so we'll start now, and then uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. Um, so part and parcel of this whole thing uh, we, is that uh, we're going to be today. We're going to be talking about like software compliance through automation and how we can actually achieve that via um, the mm -hmm. GitLab platform and some of like our concerns about what's going on uh, in this world of compliance today. Um, do let me know if you have any questions. You know, feel free to ask questions in the Q and A box, and then uh, we'll 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 try to answer that as possible. Right. So just a bit of an intro for myself. My name is Jonathan, and I am based out in Singapore, and I am part of the Social Architect team uh, for the past two and a half years, nearing three years now, and um, sort of worked with the region and a lot of customers. Um, here. So my previous background was um, into um, sort of like search engine technologies for like, and also from a monitoring background. So that's kind of like where I came from. And it's been a pretty good time to also know or to, to, to hear about like what, what's going on in the DevOps world. It's really enriched, enriched my experience across uh, technology in general. Um, so again, feel free to find uh, in the Q&A chat box, you know, you can actually submit questions. If you have questions, if run out of uh, questions, we'll uh, follow up with the uh, via email to answer some of those questions or the like, longer form questions or, uh, you know, you might be interested in, you know, uh, purchasing GitLab in certain ways or other, just uh, we'll, 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 we'll go with you. Uh, session will be recorded and then uh, you can actually see it later on. So for example, if the leaks that might have been interested but were not able to attend, uh, please go ahead and share that video later on. So today's agenda is going to be pretty light and um, I'll try to go through as quickly as possible. Um, so we'll go through some slides first, which are pretty short. After that, we'll go through like some of the compliance features that we'll have, uh, including a demo and then the Q&A. Right. So this whole session will be approximately 35 minutes and Q&A as well. Um, you know, it could actually last longer, but we'll try and make it uh, short and sweet and, you know, have more time for Q&A if there needs to be one. Right. So an intro to compliance, uh, we start out with what is compliance, right? So compliance, as the slide says, is a state of being in accordance with established guidelines, specifications of uh, process of becoming so. Uh, I think that's just a definition of how it be. Basically, in uh, the world of compliance today, there are a lot of standards that are already available, such as HIPAA, GDPR, OSHA, and many, many different others. Uh, these are sort of like uh, internationally accepted compliance frameworks. But at the same time, at an organization level, you might have certain compliance that are may not be as um, uh, sort of 
of um, as detailed, but there are certain things that you would want your organizations to adhere to in terms of like certain standards or so. So some of the things that we'll be covering, such as maybe every pipeline should always run security checks before it is actually pushed to a uh, protected branch or so. So how can we actually do that in GitLab and how can this be achieved via the various features and tools that GitLab is able to uh, so, uh, show off in this case? So what happens when you're not compliant, right? So, I mean, if you're in Europe and then if you don't comply to certain things such as GDPR, um, there are definitely a lot of uh, monetary penalties that can come into place. Uh, there's also other things such as you might get banned. For example, in the in, in a Singapore context, if you're in a financial type uh, situation and you're not compliant with uh, MAS or something like that, they may not allow you to actually function as a business or so. So compliance is a very important feature. It is might be very dry and uh, not so interesting, but it's a very necessary thing that we need to actually adhere to uh, across. And not even more, and even more so in today's day and age, when you are looking into like a DevSecOps platform where uh, it's getting more and more complex. A lot of customers that I work with, uh, their DevSecOps platforms could be a multitude of tools such as maybe five to six different tools and ensuring that all of the different tools out there are compliant, it's very difficult. And that's where I think like GitLab, uh, we pride ourselves as being a DevSecOps platform in which we are able to control uh, a lot of these processes within our platform as a whole. Right. So how can compliance be achieved? Um, and some of the things are setting rules and policies to adhere to workflows, uh, having a single source of truth, having high level and low level audit data. So how one way is to ensure that uh, these frameworks are in place. But the other thing is also to observe in case people um, are not able to follow these things or like find weak, uh, workarounds, right? So Having auditable data is very, very important, especially when it comes back down uh, during your, your security audits or when you're doing IT audits, you need to know that these things exist and more, right? So other types of compliance needs that you might have, it may not be uh, necessarily regulatory, but maybe just at an organization or a team level that you are expected certain types of things to run as, as needed. Right. So. What does GitLab have to offer in terms of a compliance feature? First and foremost, policy management, right? So for policy management, you can display all of the policies for the available environments. So having a single place where you have all your policies in place, you can create, edit, disable policies and store them as code. And the good thing about having them stored as code rather than, you know, like something like a drug drag down menu or something that you can drag and drop is that these sort of things can be also scalable in the sense where you can copy this code and ship it to multiple different environments or multiple different groups um, where you can actually do all these things. And last but not least, separation of duties. Because we are able to store these compliance code and policies in separate uh, locations, you can then have a sort of like a separation of duties where you have link it up with your RBAC controls where certain types of people will have access to the policies, but these people will not have access to the underlying code in between, right? So having two different like uh, uh, role bases that can do their own things. So what are some of these policy types? First and foremost, scan result policy, right? So if vulnerabilities will be de detected as part of your pipeline uh, vulnerability checks, can you sort of have a dynamic way of requiring approvals from the specific type of people uh, if such things were detected? Secondly, um, your scan execution policies, right? So during the uh, running of your pipelines, can you force people to run certain types of jobs, right? Say, for example, whenever you run a pipeline, you run you want a static analysis uh, SAS scan right, to run uh, whenever your pipelines are running into a feature branch. License policy is also one of them. So certain types of licenses may be uh, commercial in nature, and you don't want your developers to be downloading libraries off the internet 
and using them in public websites uh, because this would actually uh, we have seen some of these situations happen where people are using libraries and not paying for them and then get into lawsuits because of that. So having the automated way of checking for some of these licenses and denying some of these merge requests from happening is very, very necessary for this to happen. And last but not least, uh, operational container scanning, right? So uh, this is actually a very highly requested feature over the past one or two years or so um, in which con containerization has become sort of like the norm in terms of like how deployments are being done today. And one thing that uh, people want to know is that after deployment and maybe there is no more new development work that's happening for that particular project, are there ways in which GitLab is able to help you to scan on these containers on a regular basis to ensure that newer vulnerabilities are being detected uh, as a whole, right? So not only during the development phase, but post-development during the deployment phase, how are these uh, containers being scanned and make sure that uh, these vulnerabilities are being checked at, uh, regularly? Some of these guard rails also ensure that these things can uh, um, help help organizations, uh, you know, have that check and balances. So first and foremost, prevent approval by author. So can you imagine if you were to write vulnerable code in and then you scan all of your vulnerable code and you decide that, okay, maybe today I'm too busy. I'm not, I just don't want to deal with it. I'll just merge the code first and I forget about it, right? So preventing approval by author is a very, very important feature um, that we've seen with a lot of organizations. Uh, because we want to have that separation of duties again, right? So other things that you can have, you know, require user password to approve some of these things to also allow you to have more and more control or have that checks and balances in place. So pivoting a little bit, we also have compliance frameworks in this case. And what these compliance frameworks can be is that you can come up with a whole list of uh, a few over here. So for example, if you're to ensure that GDPR is uh, and, uh, adhered in your code bases, you can have a compliance framework in which you would run assigned compliance pipelines, right? So you can have a SOC one as well, uh, in which that it would also run a different type. So what you could do at a, at a project level is that you can then tag individual projects in which um, they are supposed to adhere to uh, certain types of um, um, compliance governance frameworks, and then they would automatically also run the code. Sort of, sort of like an include feature, but this include feature is not known to the user and they cannot exclude it as they need to. Right. Uh, it might sound a bit complex. Um, that's the reason why we'll have a demo later to kind of show you a little bit of how this would look like. All right, so just to do a bit, a little bit of a quick summary here. First one, we did have some of the policies that we have in place. So policies was uh, dynamically, you can actually change certain things like if a certain threshold were to be reached, um, then a certain type of action will be done. Compliant frameworks in this case is slightly different. You don't have really a threshold or a condition, but in this case is that as long as you are tagged with this particular framework, all of these types of frameworks would be actually run on projects wise and uh, you, you don't have a choice on it, right? Likewise to the policy, you have that separation of duties because compliance frameworks can be are also managed separately on a different uh, platform or a different project. Earlier I mentioned, it's very important not only to put in place these guardrails and frameworks, but also to have the ability to audit some of these things, right? So auditability, so GitLab has an inbuilt audit event system in which that, for example, if certain types of frameworks were to be changed or if there were uh, uh, changes made to the approvals list, who is able to approve, all of these things are audited. And as a auditor, you know, this will make it a lot easier for you to audit some of these things and make your organization's life a bit easier as well. So these comprehensive reports are already available within the platform. Or if not, we do have APIs available for audit events to be exported somewhere else if you want to do it in a big data sort of nature. Right. 
So this one is beyond the scope of policies or compliance, but more from an observability standpoint in terms of like how are security analysts, how are developers able to look at these different types of uh, vulnerabilities and able to action on these things. So say for example, if you have a critical vulnerability, what do you do with it? What's the workflow that you do with it? How does a security engineer is able to flag out such a new uh, vulnerability and then pass it over to the developer uh, easily without having to call them up, without having to sit beside them at the table and then discuss all of these things, but able to do remotely um, and able to have that level of um, assurance that all of these things will be action on. If not, there is a paper trail out there and then, you know, there's audit events that you can see these things. Confidential issue is also a very important one. The idea behind it, because you don't want to make it known to maybe everyone in the company that there is a vulnerability in case of back, back actors in this case, where they might take note that, hey, you know, there's a vulnerability, I can exploit that and I can get some of this information before these things are being uh, fixed. Right. So this is the typical workflow as you might see. You start out with creation of an issue into a merge request, commit your changes, and then you go through your security scans, going down to like a proof of changes and pipeline runs and all of these different things. The ones that are, are very much focused on in this portion of, the, of this would be during the uh, code and security reviews and a, approval of changes where we have that guardrails and the ability to actually uh, assign policies and everything like that. So th that's where, where we will be focusing a lot more on today. Right, so now we'll go on to the demo. Again, I wanted to mention, I want to keep the Q&A, uh, so, sorry, I wanted to keep the sort of like the presentation slides as uh, little as possible and move into like the actual platform. Uh, but again, feel free uh, to ask any questions in the Q&A box while I'm doing the demo. And we'll just sort of like go through a few different features uh, of what GitLab has. And, and um, do let me know, you know, if I am um, there's something that needs to be repeated. I can see that there is a slight delay on this uh, platform. So if I'm going too fast, which I'll try my best to go a bit slower, um, let me know. Uh, if not, I will just continue on. All right. So first and foremost, let's uh, see what the, let's kind of familiarize or navigate around on what I'm going to be demoing on. Right. So let me just see, I'm on the right screen. Yeah, okay. All right, so this is the GitLab platform and this is my group, right? So I have a compliance workshop group here and I have a few different projects that have been created or are being created uh, because of this, this, uh, this demo. First and foremost, sim simple notes, that's my demo application over here. Separation of due, so there's also like security policies and as well as compliance frameworks that are separate projects altogether. I do also have a separate subgroup in which I would actually segregate my QA team as well as my uh, security team as well, right? So why I do this is because I can add members to uh, these sub separate uh, subgroups of people and assign them uh, relative um, work to be done, right? So if the security team will need to approve certain security related uh, vulnerabilities, I can just refer them to the security team, right? If you link this up well with your own LDAP system or if you have your own SSO system, this can be dynamically um, done. So as an organization level, you don't have to worry that much. All right. Right, so looking at this structure, we'll just go into the um, project directly. Right, so this demo project is basically made up of a few different um, languages. It has a little bit of about 50% of Python also, a little bit of HTML, a little bit of shell, a little bit of JavaScript, and a little bit of CSS, right? So this is a demo application, uh, it's just a demo. It could be anything else over here. One thing to take note is that there is, of course, this um, tag that I have here. And basically, this is where the compliance framework is applied accordingly. I'll show you later on how this is applied and where do you actually um, change some of these things. 
Um, but that's a little bit later. Let's just go through the basics of the project. Scrolling down, we can see like this is basically the source code of what the project is. Um, pretty standard type of uh, structure of a layout. But one thing I would just want to highlight quickly is like the GitLab CI file. So the GitLab CI file is sort of like the backbone of what GitLab's CI CD is like. So all your jobs and all your tasks that are uh, required to be run as part of your CI CD pipelines, all of these things will be stored in the GitLab CI file. And let's quickly take a look at what this looks like. So within this GitLab CI file, we can actually see that there are multiple stages that have been defined over here. And what this does is that this gives you a structure in terms of like a staged way of like how tasks are being built in place. Reason why you want to do this is because maybe certain jobs might be required to be run first before other jobs are, uh, depending on some of the things such as maybe your build nature, right? You want your build to run first because you want to build a dockerized container in which you can then run your security scans on. You don't want that to happen after that, right? Some of these things, right? So there could be multiple reasons on how you want to structure these things. Some of these templates have been added as well. Um, so GitLab, we do have a lot of security uh, templates that are involved, and I'll go through some of the security scans that we have. Um, but what all these templates do is that this makes your life a lot easier because you don't have to specify that this is a Java project or this is a .NET project, this is a JavaScript project also. Our templates are dynamically um, smart enough in a way uh, to be able to sense what kind of languages you have in your, your package and therefore apply the correct scanners accordingly. Right. So below here, you can see that there's a, a, a much more detail in terms of like the different stages or so, uh, what we're doing during the build stage, um, in the pages, in the unit tests, and everything like that. Gem gymnasium, that's for our dependency scanning, some of the different things that we have here. Right. So there's a lot of different kinds of things that come into place. I will not go through in detail what these are. This is probably another session for more for security or more for CI CD in terms of like structure and nature. So you might uh, look out for those type of uh, workshops that might be running later on um, when uh, we, we do have some of these ones. Right. So if you see here, just do a quick look, you can see that there are certain types of jobs that are being run here. And these are the stages, right? So let's quickly just do a run of that inside our CD, CI CD pipelines and see how that looks like. All right. So I've already done a few jobs, but let's like quickly show how that done. So over here, you can run it for your multiple different types of branches. I'll just run it for the main pipeline now. And let's see how that looks like. So automatically, you can see that certain jobs have been run, like the build job, there is a verify poem, there is the test job, and then there's like the deploy job, followed by your desk, and so on and so forth, right? So multiple different jobs that have been running, and this could take a little bit of time, right? Um, something to take note is that part and parcel of the prerequisites of setting this up was that all of these jobs are running on a Kubernetes cluster, right? Uh, to us, at GitLab, we feel that uh, Kubernetes is one of our recommended way of how you can actually scale your runners. And what your runners basically do are these sort of like the workhorses that actually run all of these individual jobs for you. Kubernetes is a great tool because not only uh, is it sort of like auto scaling, you don't actually use as much resources if you are not actually using anything. Uh, and you can scale back and scale forward um, as the amount of uh, traffic increases. So how can that be done? Just very quickly over here, you can come into your infrastructure and Kubernetes cluster where you can actually link them up with um, various flavors of your Kubernetes, right? So some of your various flavors, you could be doing some of the serverless types of Kubernetes like EKS and so on and so forth, or you can have using vanilla Kubernetes and just installing the, the, the required components and linking them up. Right. So I'm not going into detail. Again, this is probably another session to be had, um, but some of the prerequisites for you to actually run these things would be to uh, set it up in a Kubernetes cluster. All right. So this is going to take a while, of course. Um, there's quite a few things that has been done, but let's look at one that has been completed already. All right. So I ran one, uh, I think, last night as well, 
and then there is something that uh, that this is what it will look like. Right. So there's a few jobs that we, it would happen, right? Uh, I just want to uh, sort of like draw your eyes to this first job over here, the dot free job. Uh, if you remember vaguely, just now when I was going through the CI file, the dot pre job did not exist, right? Inside the CI file, there were the other jobs over there. I, if if we have time, we'll go through a little bit more. But the dot pre job did not exist. So what happened was that uh, just ahead of time, sort of like giving a bit of a spoiler, I was able to actually apply a compliance framework to this particular pipeline, such that uh, anyone that is adhering to my pipe my 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 workflow needs to run this pre job. Right, this compliance jobs first before anything else can run. Right, so this again goes back to the idea of that governance and that ability to run jobs and make sure that your developers are not skipping tasks, they are not actually avoiding certain types of jobs while they are running their, their work. All right, so it goes through the build job, it goes through all of the different things over here, such as your uh, depending on whatever you want. So if you can see that Verify Poem, this is a custom stage that we actually created and the custom jobs that we have, as well as all the different types of jobs that we have here. Right. I'll quickly go through some of these ones over here. So we do have some of the things such as container scanning. Um, on container scanning, we leverage on certain technologies such as um, Trivi um, to be able to scan some of these things. Code quality, we do leverage on code climate. A lot of it, we are, uh, you know, GitLab is an open source um, um, company, we do believe in the, we do believe in open source, and we do believe that there are certain tools out there that we can leverage on because they do have a very very good following, and a lot of people are contributing to the databases and all. Gymnasium is something that is uh, sort of internal. So for dependency scanning wise, we do actually man, um, uh, we do actually manage the database for Gymnasium, but of course it's a project that's available out there. So if you have any vulnerabilities or so, you can definitely submit there, and then we will include that in our database. Other things such as Kicks, so Kicks is, uh, I think it's managed by Checkmarks as of today. And out of and for Kicks wise, um, this is for your IACs, so your, for your infrastructure at code testing to make sure that, you know, uh, while your infrastructure is code testing, such as uh, things such as like your cloud formation uh, templates, uh, things such as like your Ansible scripts or your Terraform scripts or so, they adhere to certain standards and they don't have vulnerable code in them, right? So exposing ex exposing ports that should not be exposed or certain things such as, you know, your volumes are not being secured or anything like that. Other things I just want to quickly mention is, for example, your unit tests. So your unit tests in this case um, are something that you could Define on your own out there. Uh, we do um, work with a lot of unit test um, uh, type um, solutions out there. And as long as these unit tests are within the format uh, as needed to uh, that GitLab can consume, we will be able to consume them as needed. Secret detection is also a very big one over here. So for secret detection, is say, for example, developers during the development phase, they might actually be hard coding some of like maybe AWS keys or they might be um, Kubernetes keys rather than actually using the proper methods of, uh, you know, storing them in a vault-like nature and then retrieving them as needed to be, right? So during development, it's very understandable. You're still trying to figure a lot of things out. But over time, when you're moving into production, you want to make sure that um, a lot of these things are uh, eradicated from your code base because, you know, you don't want them into your production code. People have access to it. That means they would have access to your whole AWS environment also. Right, so some of these things are very, very important um, in, in which that you're, you need to be able to um, scan for these things. After that, we go through the deploy stage. After scanning everything that's uh, available here, say, for example, a question that I think I get a lot is that, say, for example, if one of these uh, stages were to fail, what would happen? Does it skip all the stages in the end? Um, Preferably, we would suggest that you don't because this is still on a feature branch that's happening. Right now, of course, you I, I did mention that when I was running this, it was on the main branch, but during a development phase, you would actually create a feature branch. You would then run all of these pipelines accordingly. And this is only isolated in a development branch, right? So what you would want to do is that probably you want to actually allow all of your different security jobs to run first, get a summarized report, 
and then be able to work on all these things, even though they are actually um, continue to deploy into a, a Kubernetes cluster or a dev environment. Second reason is because if you are actually running um, your desk, right? So your dynamic analysis scan, you do need a review application or an application where your desk uh, vulnerability scan can run. And therefore you should actually still run your deploy stage. After running your deploy stage, this is where we run our dynamic scanners, such as our fast testing and our desk scanning as well, right? So all is good and all, right? So you can see that all of it has run to completion. There aren't many things. Next thing is how do we actually see where all of these vulnerabilities are or if there are any vulnerabilities, right? So if you have a tick over here, that doesn't mean that uh, there are no vulnerabilities. It just means that the job has completed. But where do we actually view all of these vulnerabilities? So if you go into the uh, security tab on your screen, on my screen, I mean, you can see that a result page has been uh, generated. So within this result page, you can see that there are multiple types of vulnerabilities that were detected as part and parcel of running this pipeline. Your DEST, your SAST, your container scanning, and there's quite a lot of container scanning ones over here. Um, and then various others as well, All right? So over here, we do give you a whole summary. You can actually download all of these different results into uh, sort of like a CSV file or something like that. Um, but if you would like to work on it directly on the page itself, you can actually see them here, right? So there's certain types of things here, like, okay, I can also sort them by different types of severity levels and also sort of different types of tools here, right? So for example, if I'm a security analyst and my job is not to focus on CEST, but I would like to focus on today, what should I focus on? All right, let's focus on the dependency scanning in this case, right? So if I go into independency scanning, automatically it helps me to sort out what the dependency scanning vulnerabilities are. I can come in here and then I can look through some of these ones. There's quite a few critical. Um, there's quite a few ones that uh, you could potentially look at. So maybe if I were to click into one of them, what this does is that it gives me a summary of what my vulnerability looks like. Right. It has been detected. Where has it been detected? So it's obvious uh, from uh, with, because it's a vulnerability uh, as a dependency scan. It's actually looking through the yarn.log file. All right. Identifiers, right? So how how is it identified? So there's of course some of the CVEs that are uh, available now. And what the solution is. So they'll tell you exactly where the vulnerable package is, as well as some of these solutions that will be. So over here, you can then create an issue or you can dismiss the vulnerability if your security team or when you have discussions, you decided that, hey, you know, this is considered a false positive or something that is not going to be relevant in my uh, organization. That's something that you can definitely do fine. All right. All right, so this is from a single pipeline. And later on, I'll kind of show you a little bit about how we, this can be um, viewed in terms of a project level or even at a group level basis. Going back into the top, right? So we go back into the pipeline. We can actually see that uh, the jobs are being run. We can actually see the different licenses as well, what kind of licenses there are, right? So there are denied licenses as well. And I'll go a little bit into this as well because uh, we can we'll be I'll be showing you how to set those up, as well as some of the things such as code quality, right? You can actually see some of the different things, right? So I hope you can kind of see like the beauty of how this whole platform has been set up in a way that when you run a single pipeline, you are able to see not only just a like one tool or like what the results are for one tool, but everything is consolidated in a single report for you as part of a platform. Right. So you don't have to do contact switching where you're logging into multiple systems and, and all that. All right. So quickly, what we're going to do is that right now we can see that there's, there are vulnerabilities, but what we want to do is that how are we able to actually uh, um, set up some of these policies? All right. So we go into security and compliance and we go into policies here. Quickly, there are some of the policies that I've created previously, but let's just do a new one. 
So the first policy, I'm just waiting for my screen to catch up. Yep. Uh, so for my first policy that I want to look at is that first and foremost is my scan result policy. Right. So scan result policy means that after, you know, just now you have seen the results of like all of the different vulnerabilities, how are we able to actually um, action all of these things or ensure that the proper quality gates are put in place. All right. So let's select this policy. Right. Over here, you can see that there are some of the things that we can actually configure here. You can actually run it in the YAML format. So you can, if you would like to, you can write it here in the YAML format, but let's use the UI for today. So today we are just going to do one that is for, just now we were doing one for uh, dependency scanning, right? Right, and in enable. So here is where you kind of define the rules. If the security scan from dependency scanning finds more than zero critical or high vulnerabilities newly, that are newly detected and a open merge request as yeah for all for all branches for in this case then you require an approval, right? So that is the ability for you to actually control and, and, and allow um, that quality gate to be put in place, right? So I just repeat it a little bit quickly is that first and foremost, we are creating a scan result policy. And what this does is that when a scan runs to completion, there are more than zero means there's one, uh, one or more uh, critical and severe vulnerabilities from dependency scanning. I would like for approval action from the security team, right? So over here, you can then search for your users here. Um, let me just quickly do for my team on limb demo slash compliance workshop slash approvals. And then from the security team. Oh, okay. Right. So automatically, this gives me the ability to control who has the has one. So this is actually very important because maybe your security team might be built up of multiple different people, or you might have different approvals that you might want to have. One for QA, one for security, and you want to have multiple levels of approval, sort of like a workflow nature, right? So here, we're going to configure with a merge request. And what you see here is that it actually brings me into a different project, which I'll show you later as well. Just now, remember earlier on, I did show you sort of like the navigation way. We have our demo application and we have a separate project that is only for uh, my policies. So this is where the policy nature is. And then I can just quickly merge this. Right. So of course, now I'm a person who has the ability to do across two projects, but if I were to go back quickly as well, I will to look at my workshop. This could be a separation of duties because you don't want your developers to be able to set their own policies by themselves, right? So now I'll go back into my application. Just now where I was, was at the security policy project over here. Automatically GitLab will help you to create that project for you. Uh, and if you have an existing project, it will just help you to actually organize all of these things into your security pro uh, policy project. Right. So step one done, right? So step one is we have actually created a dynamic policy in which that if there are new uh, dependency uh, vulnerabilities that are being scanned, automatically it will check against if they are highly critical or if they are, they, and there's a degradation in that sense, the security team will then have to step into place to actually approve some of these things. Next thing, we will look at it from a license nature. So how do you actually do it? Right, so I go back into my security and compliance, I can come into my license compliance here. In my license compliance uh, way, over here, I can actually see all the different types of licenses that are detected. So automatically by default, GitLab will actually detect the licenses for you. All you need to do is really to create the policies as you need it. 
So over here, I have some of the license here, right? So say for example, I choose not to have a Apache license, right? So if any time that an Apache license were to be used, depending on the libraries that you have uh, imported, so on and so forth, I would want to deny that. And only if a security person or a QA person were to actually approve this nature, then uh, it can be merged into a master branch or a protected branch or so. Right. So let's, uh, let's, show, let's see how that can be done. Um, so you can create a deny uh, license approval, and then you can actually add a certain license type. So for example, if I were to add something like this, right? So uh, I don't want anything that is the, using the academic free license uh, version 2.0, and then I will deny this. Automatically, when I create this denial, it will actually create a new rule here, a policy rule such that anytime it sees that particular license being used, it would actually create a, that, that uh, approval thing. Um, license approvals are inactive over here, so I have not created that as well. So automatically it comes here, and then it will also, um, what you need to do is that you need to update approvals as needed to be. Um, and over here, you can then search for groups over here as well. So same likewise, you can do, um, for me, is uh, John Lim. And more. Compliance uh, from my QAT over here. And then I add that approval. Right. So now this has been done. And in the future, for example, if one of these few licenses um, will actually have this issue, what will happen will, will be that my QA team will need to step in place and look at it in that nature. All right. So that's kind of like how we actually run this, this thing. Next thing is, let's see from a workflow. Just now when I, I show you like a developer workflow, we actually start out from a, uh, creating an issue all the way to actually creating a merge request. And let's do that. Just now what we did was that we only did a pipeline run directly and on the main branch, but we didn't do it uh, for, for, for anything else. All right. So we started with an issue, and I'll create a quick issue here. Our issue board, again, we probably have another webinar to talk about it. We have different types of epics, workflows, uh, and things such as that we can do in terms of like assigning story points, uh, proper tag natures, and everything like that. But let's start with something simple here. So we'll do another one, which is that we're going to add new code that's vulnerable. Obviously, in the real world, uh, you're not going to do that but we're just going to show you how that could be potentially done as well. Right. I see that there are some questions over there. There's like a pre-stage and everything. Um, I'll show you that a little bit later. That's more from, not from a policy standpoint, but more from a compliance uh, framework standpoint. Uh, I'm just going to show you like sort of like the overarching thing as well. Um, unfortunately, to be honest, like we're trying to crack trying to cover as many things as possible, uh, but we might miss out a few things because of like the time. All right, so let's create an issue over here. And with this issue, let's create a merge request, right? So of course, details, you can actually fill them up later with like labels and everything like that, like critical and everything, uh, but let's not focus on that now. So if we create a new, feed, a new merge request here, uh, of course, there are some of the things such as, you know, um, um, approval rules, right? So over here, like what we mentioned here, you can create your approval rules. It can be dynamic or it can be something that is hard coded in this case, right? So if you know there are certain things like you would require them, you're not really trying to do it from a policy type nature. You're just going to have a certain team that always need to approve certain things. You can do it directly over here as well. Or if not, our best case is that we will always um, try to do it from a policy nature because that's more dynamic, right? So I'll add one more approval rule here, and then I'll just uh, add someone from like the from my uh, namespace uh, generic approval, right? So you could do that here, right? So quickly. Um, I have, I will then create a merge request and we will just look at it in another 
uh, we will we'll try to, to, to sort of like simulate this. So here we will actually do some of it, which is like we'll open the code in the web IDE to show how this looks like. So uh, recently we did quite a bit of changes in terms of our web IDE and how we are actually, uh, you can actually um, sort of like do this um, web remote web development. Um, so more details can be you can read a blog about it, and like uh, we are uh, we are actually going to be doing a lot more work on on this as well. So from our CI file, maybe I'll just do a very quick, uh, uh, you know, just a, a, a additional line of code here. Um, this, this new, and then we'll do a merge over here. Right. So you know, commit to a new branch, uh, and maybe you know put like proper commit messages like. Uh, Adding comments to CI file. Right. So since we are over here, I just want to also let you see there is no pre-stage that are being here. And I'll mention it a little bit later. Right. So I'll commit to a new branch and then I will also let it run as needed to be. Right. So let's go back to the project over here and see what has been done. Automatically, you can see that there are certain pipelines that are running. And then at the same time, a merge request has been, uh, has been is also created as well. So let's look at this one over here. And then there's the pipelines that are running. So of course, this will take a little bit of time. But, one, but once this, uh, these pipelines will start to run, uh, after uh, afterwards, there will be certain things that will be uh, uh, that will come into play. So let's take a look at something that has been completed, right? So after you have all of these things, because what it needs to is that the jobs have to run to completion. The policies need to come into place because they are dynamic, depending on what kind of results you get from these pipelines. But one of the things that you will be able to see is that everything would then be put in place in terms of a pipeline nature, right? So. Like I mentioned earlier, this pipeline has come into place. You do have your approvals that you need to come into place here. So for example, if you have the uh, different types of approvals, here you would then see a summarized overview in terms of something that has changed. So code quality hasn't changed because I haven't changed any uh, real code. I've only added in some comments. Some of the things such as license compliance has come into place, right? So such as policy matchings and everything like that. So far, it has detected nine licenses, but it hasn't. Uh, there isn't a problem with regards to that. Security scanning also, it gives you a multitude of like the different types of security scan, right? So all of these things are things that you should be thinking. Earlier on when I was showing you security scans, they, they were just individual. But at the same time, once what we are showing here over here is that it's not only just individual, it's actually from a merge request perspective. And then ready to merge and so on and so forth. So this one is one of the examples that everything is fine. And then it did not trigger any of these things. But say, for example, one that I created about a week ago, this is something that it did not allow me, right? So there's approval that is required from my security team. And unless I get that approval, I will see this result, which is merge is locked, right? So I'm not able to allow that merge to happen because it actually um, goes against the policies that I do have. Right. So this whole thing, as you can see, we, we looked at two different ones. First and foremost, um, our scan result policy. So for example, if something were to, uh, to, to um, how you say, violate that uh, scan result policy, you will be able to see that something is blocking. For example, if it's something that is related to uh, your licenses as well, those are the things that also will also block as needed to be. All right. Moving very quickly into the next one, which is our compliance. So just now, I think there's quite a bit of ask about, hey, you know, where exactly is this um, pre-stage that I actually created and it's forced to run no matter what, even if I have not defined it over here. So let me show you where that is actually today, right? So if you see over here within my, 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 my folder, I have a lot of like different types of uh, applications that I've worked with customers on. This is at the top level group. So this is the John Lin demo top level group, as you can see here from, it might be a bit small, but it's at my top level group of my uh, project. And what I see here, what you can uh, see here is also under my settings. Okay, so I think I zoomed in a bit too much. Uh, 
So over here, you can actually see that under the general, this is where you define your compliance frameworks, right? So you can add a new framework and the one that we are actually doing is from the compliance deploy framework. What it does is that what you are able to do is that you can name a framework and then you can you can then specify a particular pipeline. Right. So over here, what it does is that any projects that are tagged with this particular framework, it would actually have to go through this particular pipeline first before other things can be run. Right. So if there's any conflicting natures, depending on like the dynamic dynamic things, certain things can be defined and then also overwritten as needed to be. But whatever that happens in this compliance framework pipelines needs to run. Right. So certain things you can also leave out. So where is this actually? So it's under my workshop and compliance file. So very, very quickly, I'll let me show you where that is. So in my compliance workshop here, I do have a compliance file that is on that is uh, under the folder of HIPAA. And if I were to look into here, this is where this pre-job is running, right? Right. So whatever that you see that that stage of pre-job is running is happening over here within my compliance uh, framework pipeline, right? So everything that every job that has been run, the, no choice because the whole project has been tagged by this compliance framework, everyone needs to run this particular job. So of course, this is just more from demonstration perspective. You can flesh it out a little bit more. So I know companies who, you know, at various different stages of their whole pipeline, they might require certain things to be run uh, so that, um, you know, people don't skip on certain types of job. Right. So that's an explanation of a few different features. First and foremost, you do see them from a uh, result policy. You do see it from a license perspective and you do see it from a compliance pipeline nature. Let's look at it and sort of shift gears in a different way to see it from a security standpoint. So if I were to go back to my application, I know this is a bit jumpy, but in terms of like separation of duties, I'm trying to do like two or three different roles. And therefore that's kind of it. But the idea of it is the separation of roles and the control that you might have um, with actually doing these sort of things. All right. So coming back here, just now we looked at security vulnerabilities at a pipeline level, at a merge request level, but how about from a project level? So if you do come in here and look at it from a security and compliance standpoint, you can look at it from a vulnerability report. What this does for you is that it actually allows you to see a summarized overview of all the different types of vulnerability, right? And as I mentioned earlier, there are many different types of vulnerabilities and you can have all the different types of uh, filters that you can put into place. So say, for example, let's look at something that is uh, under our desk scanning, right? So what we see here is that there are certain types of things and what you could do here is that maybe this is a low vulnerability and I find that this is, I can consider this, you know, I don't really need to deal with. So what I can do here is that I can change my status to something that's dismissed and change that. First and foremost, important thing is that all, of, all these things will be uh, locked under my, also this, all these things will be known and it doesn't mean that once you dismiss it, you will, it will be lost. For the future, if you want to see something that is dismissed, you can also come in here and see all of the different types of um, uh, statuses as well. So you can come back to it as well. All right, so those are my desk and automatically you, said, you can see that it has disappeared from here because of the filters that I put into place. Let's not look at desk, but let's look at something that's dependency scanning. And over here, maybe I just want to look at something like uh, this high photo prototype pollution in async. Uh, issue. Here it tells me all the details as I mentioned be before. It tells me all the different things and then it tells me a solution over here, right? Pretty straightforward. So something that a developer can do very quickly and then can resolve it accordingly. What I can do here is that then automatically I can actually create this into an uh, issue. The moment I create the issue, automatically it helps me to populate everything nicely here. I can then assign this to the developer, say for example, I'm assigning it to uh, Bernard, who is on the call and helping me with the Q&A today. Oh, he's not part of the project. So uh, maybe I'll assign it to someone else. Uh, so I'll assign it to Ian 
and then uh, I can create this issue. Automatically, uh, he gets a notification depending on how you set up your notifica notification. And what he needs to know now is that, hey, you know, I have something that I need to work on. Uh, and then he has all the details that he needs. Importantly, also, like I mentioned earlier, this is confidential. You don't want everybody to know about it. You only need the people required to actually see some of these things happen. Right. So that's kind of that workflow that we want to see as well. Uh, the next thing that you also, that I just want to like sort of like demo at the last part of it is also some of the uh, container policies, right? So let's go back here. We've seen it from a overall perspective and the workflow of how a security person will do it. Say for example, a, com a, a whole project has been developed to completion and now we want to run regular scans on our containers. So what we can do is that in the security perspective, if you have to look at the policies, I can then create a new policy here. So if I do a new policy, I can say a scan execution policy, right? So run it at a strategic time frame, right? So if on a scheduled basis and for the branch on the agent, right? So select the agent over here. I think my agent name is, let me quickly, I Suddenly, I can't remember my agent name, uh, but from my infrastructure, Terraform cluster, right? So if my simple nodes agent, so this is my, uh, this is my cluster uh, in, um, in, in Kubernetes, right? So in, my, in the namespaces over here, for my agent over here, right? So for this agent, it runs at uh, every night at, uh, at, at, at uh, 12 a.m. Then run a desk scan or a container scanning, right? And then over here for the container scanning over here, select automatically, and then um, do 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 all these things. So what basically this does is that at a regular everyday scanning, it will then run a container uh, container scanning at 12 a.m. every day. What this does is that this would actually set up this regular scanning portion and. If there are new vulnerabilities that will come into place, automatically it will go into a report nature, and then you can actually configure them as need be. All right, so this is a, a container scanning. And you can configure that with merge request. Like the one that we did previously with the uh, scan execution policies, this will also be in a separate policy project that you can actually merge over here. Let's look at where all of these things are. So if I go back to my project directly, uh, of course, I'm a bit more familiar with the way that I'm actually running with all of these uh, uh, breadcrumbs. Uh, but for example, if my security and vulnerability report, where all of these results will come into place is under the second tab, which is operational vulnerability. So quickly, it's security compliance and vulnerability reports. And under operational vulnerabilities, you can see that all of these different ones. You can see where which clusters they are coming from. So if you have multiple Kubernetes clusters and they are running separately, you can also separate that out individually. Looking into individual ones of them, I can then see what other ones. The scanner is trivy in this case, and it's actually certain types of things that I can fix, such as like upgrading to an, another version of Python in this case. All right. So that's kind of a coverage in terms of security execution policies in terms of like uh, scan execution policies, in terms of compliance. I know I'm running out of time because there's quite a lot that I want to show and I'm quite excited about the features here. And last but not least, I just want to show you audit feature events, right? So we have done quite a lot of different works. Where are all of these things locked, right? So if I changed approval rules and everything like that, you can see that everything is locked down as needed to be. All right. Um, there are many, many more features. I can't talk about everything, but that's kind of a high level overview in terms of like how we actually govern um, GitLab as a whole. Uh, and I think we do have a few questions in here, which I want to quickly go through. Uh, just going to see if I can get help from my team. Are there any questions that are not answered yet um, that we want to answer? Um, let me just see if the answers, which ones, any answers, any questions that are not answered yet? 
Looks like most of the questions have been answered, Jono. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so if you have any more questions, you know, maybe a couple of more minutes, you have any more questions to ask or answer. Just quickly for that. All right. If not, um, I think most uh, we, I, I honestly rushed through a little bit at the end, but um, there's quite a lot of different features and I just wanted to be a bit more detailed in talking about some of these features. Um, like we mentioned earlier, the slides and the recording will be available for downloads in later on. The slides, I think you already have access to, um, but please, you know, try at it and maybe you can set it up on your own. You know, we have a trial license that you can always set it up on your own where you can actually try some of these features. Um, I see a last one, which is uh, Leslie asking about, can this results be accessed by API? The answer is yes, you can access them by API. We do have an API for scan results. Um, a good way to actually look at it is um, directly from our GitLab API uh, from uh, vulnerabilities. So our vulnerabilities API is where you can actually do some of these ones. And of course, all of the different things that you can actually um, do all these ones. Um, can we have a session recording? Yeah, the session recording will be available. Partner specific discussions for sure. Um, I think reach out to us. Uh, I'm, we are not from the partner team, but we can definitely put you in touch. Uh, I mean, we work very closely with the partner team in terms of partner enablement and also helping you know, with you know, opportunities and everything like that. But please reach out to us. Um, um, let me show you my email again. Uh, so you can actually reach out to me. If if not, if you know the partner manager, please reach out to the partner manager directly. Um, if not, you can reach out to me and I will redirect that to, because we do have a separate team and a separate solution architect and everything like that for partners. Right. Uh, I think that's the end. I did exceed quite a little bit, so I would want to end it quickly. Uh, anything? Oh, my email is not there. Right. Right. Sorry. That's a good one. Uh, jlin at gitlab.com. I forgot to put it down. So that's my email address. It's just J and Lim, right? So my surname. Um, if not, I think that's all from me. Um, and thanks for everyone who was attending this call. I hope this was helpful for you. Of course, this is only an introduction. We do have like uh, workshops that are upcoming, which you can actually do a bit of hands-on and try them out yourself. Um, and then uh, some of these things, you, you may be able to get it, a, a, you, know, you get a better understanding of it. But um, Again, feel free to try them out. There are quite a lot of videos available outside on GitLab and you can try those things. If not, if you have a specific commercial um, thing that you might want to do, you can reach out to me or reach out to whoever that reached out to you earlier on and we will talk then. Um, I think for that, that's all I have. Um, and yeah. So Tim, should we end the session now? Yep. Thanks, Jono. Thanks for the very insightful demo. Um, we'll be sharing the recording after this has finished. Um, so look out for that in your inbox. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.